This episode contains coarse language and content that some might find troubling. Discretion is advised. Welcome back to Tech Society, the podcast delivering candid conversations with smart people, tech and business leaders, academics and more about their big ideas and how they're changing our world. And now your hosts, Alex Dunmo and John Newen. Michelle talks about how we as a society can and should provide opportunities to women in the workplace. Why targeting products towards women makes perfect business sense. Subtle ways businesses can improve messaging in recruitment drives. And how making one small specific change in schools can make a huge impact on the future of gender equality. So who I am is is Michelle Redfern and the way I describe myself is that I'm a kid who grew up in regional Western Australia. I'm not a kid anymore, but I was a kid who grew up in (laughs) regional Western Australia. So I grew up in Geraldton and could not wait to escape. So I escaped to the Big Smoke, which was Perth. Then I realised that Perth wasn't the Big Smoke. And I thought, (laughs) there's got to be more to to the world than this. And then I, I moved to Melbourne about 20 years ago. My life has been extraordinarily privileged in that I had the great fortune um, and by an accident of birth, happened to be born to two pretty groovy people. I didn't think it at the time, but um, my mum and dad were uh, very cool, very progressive for my sisters and I. I've got two younger sisters. We grew up, as I said, in the wheat belt, grew up in a very, in a very, segregated society so reasonably large aboriginal um, population in Geraldton and when I was going to primary school we had I I still don't know what the percentage is but a a large number of aboriginal kids who were you know my friends and my teammates and and all that kind of stuff and mum and dad made some pretty deliberate decisions and also really encouraged my sisters and I to be very inclusive from a young age. We didn't use that term back then, but we were given experiences or the opportunity to have experiences both around community, around customers and around inclusion that I look back on now that were pretty different from most of my friends, although I didn't realise at the time. And so the reason I tell that story is because those things that my mum and dad did and the environment I grew up in shaped who I am today. And who I am and what I stand for, just jumping over a couple of the of your questions, uh, what I stand for is equity and inclusion. And, you know, there's lots of words and there's lots of stuff that I do as a, a woman in business. But at the end, end of the day, what I do is I want to contribute to a world that's, that's equal and inclusive, where all humans are valued and respected for who they are, not what they look like, not what they sound like, not what their gender is or, or anything like that, because we've got so much unharnessed potential in the world. That is, frankly, there's so many people locked out of, and it's interesting just talking about innovation. So many people locked out of contributing to the world because of these long-held theories about who belongs and who doesn't. That's who I am and what I stand for. I'm particularly focused on gender, but intersectionality within gender. I want women and girls from all walks of life to be valued and respected. And everything that I do is about that. So I I have a portfolio of stuff that I do. I have a couple of businesses. I am a a sneaky geek. So whilst I I don't understand or want to understand the back end of of tech, I absolutely love technology and I love the way that it enables me. It's interesting. So we, we obviously read your bio and read everything you've done and watched everything you've recorded <laughs> Lord, um, you haven't done much on have you <laughs> <laughs> just being us being in technology and you know if you actually went into our engine room where our developers are now there's actually uh, embarrassing there's no female representation not on purpose you know but there's just there's no one to hire and it's it's something we've thought about right from the start because I, I believe that having a, a diverse workforce is important if you have all the same person in the room you you don't get the different insights that that you require especially when you go out to a, a wider market yeah but ultimately i believe the majority of applicants actually pretty much all the applicants are one gender you know there's there's been a lot of movements here in perth there's, there's a movement called she codes yep. and they're trying to bring in you know women into the programming world but there's something 
you know, at a society level right from the start that prevents girls from getting into tech. What are you know, what are your thoughts on that? And you know, what can we do? And in the in the spirit of transparency, I have just had a daughter, uh, my first child, <laughs> like twenty two days ago. So, so he's already yeah. thinking about getting her yeah, into tech. Yeah, uh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've you've opened up Pandora's box there, gents. That was All right. The point. <laughs> so there's there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I need to to pick apart in what you've just said. Um, or analyse, I should say. Mm. So, number one, I do hear a lot that the talent's not there, the female talent's not there, we just can't find them. My quick response when I'm a little bit irritated is, well, your recruiters aren't trying hard enough because they're there. Those women are there. And interestingly enough, and we can certainly say that in engineering, we're now getting more female engineering grads Mm. than men. Mm. And it will be the same in technology, but there's been really deliberate focus on that for the last 15 years and getting more women into engineering. So technology, we need to go right back to, well, when your daughter starts school, We need to start exposing her to the opportunities for a career in a whole bunch of different things. So Absolutely. And I think it's even before that. So one of my theories is that when computers first came out, they they weren't seen as gendered. They were Mm. a tool. And then as soon as video games started to become the driving force behind people buying computers, the marketers decided that it was only appropriate for boys. Yep. And I think we're still suffering that gendered marketing where girls don't play video games, which is obviously nonsense. And I think we're finally shedding that notion. Yeah. Look, yeah, you're absolutely right. So so societal norms and gendered expectations or gendered stereotypes still prevail. Australia has got very rigid gender stereotypes. Mm. In fact, in our workforces, we have one of the most gendered workforces in the world. And so you can see on on one side of the scale, and interestingly, Perth, mining, construction, Mm. manufacturing, male dominated to the tune of 80 plus percent. Mm. On the caring industries, teaching, nursing, childcare, aged care, women dominated in the same levels. Interestingly, they're not at leadership levels. That's another thing. So so I can certainly say that as, you know, again, I had the very good fortune to be born into the family that I was born into. So, and, and I do think growing up with two sisters, I didn't really know that girls just couldn't do anything they wanted to do. And I had very progressive parents yeah. to the point where I remember, God, this is dating me now, in 1979, <laughs> when our school got its first computer, like a high school in Geraldton with the 700 kids, we had one computer. And yes, so guess whose nose was constantly pressed up against the door going, oh, I'm going to go into the computer lab of one computer. And I remember having a conversation with my dad saying, I'd really like to be a computer programmer. Now, Given that I'm a screaming extrovert, I have the attention span of a gnat and probably even less attention to detail. That probably was never going to work out for me. However, I didn't get told that that wasn't a thing I couldn't do. Mm. I was interested in politics. I was never told that women couldn't go into politics. However, society does give boys and girls lots of messages around what's Mm. boys' work and men's work and what's girls' work and and women's work. And Australia is lagging behind global trends around that. Now, you lay intersectionality on that and you say, if you're a a woman or a person of colour, a person of alternate cultural descent or heritage than Anglo-Celtic, you've got a whole bunch of other stuff going on there. And given that we're a migrant nation, We've got we've got all these really really interesting stereotypes around who does what work. Mm. So the work has to start in the home with the parents. It has to be done at the, at school, not mm. at high school, because by the time girls are fourteen and fifteen, they've already been suckered in to the marketing or that that system of messaging. You will have known from reading about the stuff that I do that I do a lot of research into sport and women in sport, particularly women in sports leadership, and as part of that I've examined you know what is the pathway for for girls girls drop out of sport or a trite from sport between the ages of 10 and 14 at a significant rate because they become super conscious about body their body Mm. image and all of the messaging that goes on around body image they become very conscious about how they appear so on and so forth so these messages are all subliminal but Mm -hmm. they're really powerful so 
it's not up to the government or industry or parents on their own. It's up to all of us to say, mm. we've got to really take gender out of who does what job. I have clients in the manufacturing sector and some of the mindsets that we try to bust is, well, women don't belong on the manufacturing floor. With modern manufacturing, which is as technical as you're going to get, there is, you, know, you, you don't have to live, lift 25 kilo or 50 kilo reams of paper or, or things mm. like that anymore. You've got these modern machines, modern techniques, technology that really takes the, the kind of the heavy lifting out of it. Mining is the same. And we've seen companies like BHP, Fiona Vines is, is a, a senior woman who leads diversity and inclusion at BHP. They've made really strong inroads into the the imaging and the messaging around women belong here. So women belong here or girls belong here needs to be messaging from the outset. But but conversely, it needs to be the same for boys and men. Mm -hmm. So boys Absolutely. and men belong in places that they've traditionally been excluded from. Mm -hmm. So boys can be soft and gentle and have prams and dolls. Boys can play netball. Mm -hmm. Girls can play football. Dads can stay at home and be the, the, the primary stay-at-home carer for the first 12 months of the kid's life. Being masculine in Australia is, and look, I, I don't have lived experience as being a male. You too do, clearly. <laughs> but being a man in Australia, it's a tough gig because you've got to do all sorts of things, right? You've got to be a bloke and you've got to love the footy and you've yeah. got to drink beer and um, be strong and be tough. And I failed on all those counts. <laughs> Me too. Well, I, I think I'd make a pretty shit bloke as well. But anyway, oh, except I love beer and I love footy. So yesterday I decided I needed a new hat because I couldn't yep. be bothered putting product in my hair. <laughs> and I, I went to Rebel Sport and I bought this. Oh. And it's rose gold and it's actually a there women's hat. Ah, and I, thought, I like it. And I was like, what's, why the, what's, is this gendered? what's the difference? Why is this gendered? I and don't know. The men's, the men's hats were dark blue and black. Yeah. And they were yep. boring as fuck. And I yep. thought, I don't want that. And the <laughs> women's hats had way more cool colors and patterns and all, yep. all kinds of like style. Yeah. I thought, well, fuck it. It's the exact same hat. Good it just on has you. a sticker on it that says women. He's breaking it. the barriers. But why is, is it now, gendered? I, now I need to go and find that, that hat because I do have a reasonable collection of hats. So, yeah, I'm a Yankees fan. So That's cool. Yeah, so we've got, you know, we've got all of these messages that are... Pointlessly that are, gendered. Yeah, absolutely. From yeah. the outset. I mean, you go to go to the toy store or go to the toy aisle in any of the big department stores. Mm. Who decided that girls have pink stuff and boys have blue stuff. Originally, <laughs> yeah. in way history, around. pink yeah. was actually a strong colour for men. That's right. And then the marketers got hold of it way back in the, I think it was the 40s or the 50s and yeah. decided, yeah. So Mattel's got a lot to answer for. Sorry, Mattel, but anyway. Yeah, so there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, how do we get more women into tech? We start yeah. talking to girls uh, and their parents at a much earlier age about the, the vast range. The other thing that I would say, not being someone who's a techie per se, but a, a consumer of, I'm a massive consumer of tech, is we need more people with different lived experience to design mm. products and Absolutely. services and experiences that meet my needs. Yep. So I work with a, a football team, an AFL team, and one of their problem statements to me was, we don't have enough women, corporate women, as members. I said, okay, so tell me about what the the services. What what can, if I'm a corporate woman and corporate women are have dis discretionary spending power for their organisation. Mm. They have good discretionary income of their own. They want experiences. And I said, so tell me about the experiences you're offering that that avatar of of, of a, a client or a member. <laughs> All right. So let me let me ask you another question. When you're going and pitching to corporate uh, entities, when you're going and looking for the corporate dollar, please tell me you've got someone other than 28-year-old ex-players or 38-year-old ex-players, young white men, basically. Mm. Hmm. We hadn't thought about that either. I said, okay. So what you don't have, because in your design room, whatever they call it, but whoever's thinking up, dreaming up, designing and producing good services and experiences for your target market, is not representative of your target market. Mm. And if you haven't got any women in there, you're probably going to miss the mark because you don't have yeah. the lived experience of that particular woman. And you don't know what you don't know. You That's don't know right. What you're, That's right. what you're missing in your messaging. Yeah. 
So, yeah. and one of my other clients, I had a talk about a way to, you know, have a room of 50, almost all men go quiet. I said, tell me who, and, and it was a consumer, producer of consumer goods. I said, tell me who the most powerful consumer in Australia is right now. So this is for business to consumer sales. Mm. <laughs> I said, a 42 year old woman of Indian heritage. Wow. I went, what? No way. <laughs> yeah. 42 year old woman of India. We've got a huge. So specific. Yeah, I love how yeah. specific that is. It's amazing. Yeah. So, I, for, for transparency, I, I have my other businesses around culturally diverse women and workforces, and my, my business partners are of Indian descent. So, mm-hmm. I'd love to say I just knew that myself, but they've educated <laughs> me on it. So, that, that woman has enormous buying power. She has mm-hmm. extreme influence in her family, and she's got good discretionary income because they are well educated, but very well employed. So who's creating who's creating products, services and experiences for the most powerful consumer in Australia at the moment? So there's all these things around, you know, why do we need more women in tech? Why do we need more women and people of colour in tech? Why do we, you know, why, why, why? Because we need to create good services and experiences that meet the needs of our customers and our consumers. Mm-hmm. And we also want to open up career pathways for all people so that they can you know, reach their full potential. Absolutely. Because everyone wins then. Before we continue this podcast, here's a message from our sponsor. We believe that you can create art and beauty with technology. We think big. We move quietly. We are Ninja Software. I, I want to jump back to when you you pointed out you, know, you should get new recruiters. Your recruiters aren't trying hard enough. <laughs> right. Yeah. We don't we don't use recruiters, and we're we're very very recruiting is so important to us that we're very you know, hands on with it. Yep. And our re- our style for recruitment is finding the diamonds in the rough. So people who generally can't sell themselves well and, and maybe um, don't realize just how valuable they are, you know, so they they suffer from uh, imposter syndrome and, you know, things like that. And because I, I know that there is a, a difference between the genders where men are more likely to take a Hail Mary shot and apply for something they think they're not qualified for. Uh, whereas women are less likely to do that. Can you speak to that? Because obviously I can't. I mean, anything <laughs> I say on this topic is c- going to be ignorant. It's just conjecture. Yeah, no. yeah. But I, that's, that's okay. Just, just knowing my own partner, the amount of times I've had to convince her to apply for a job that I knew she was more than qualified for, but she mm. felt underqualified for. And they may, they may make a throwaway mention to a university degree, and I'm like, just by the time it. you get to that point, they don't care. Yeah, your experience yeah. speaks for itself, but she, you know she has insecurity around that that I definitely have never had in my entire <laughs> life. You know, I, mm. I've, I've applied for positions that, to be frank, I wasn't qualified for, mm. and got them. And so, I, yes, I can. Yeah. Yes, I can speak to that. So, as a parent, I would also encourage you right from the outset to yes. uh, encourage your daughter to take risks because mm. this is risk-taking behaviour, and. For Girls are taught not to take risks from a very young age. Now, some of that's being sensible, but some of it's, we we tend to, and and I'm using we, I'm being massively general, of course. Of course, yeah. We tend to ask girls to do less rough and tumble and more neat and nice. And we Mm. encourage boys to do more rough and tumble and less neat and nice. And that has, you know, that has long-term effects for both genders. In terms of the... Look, it's really interesting around women won't apply for jobs unless they're 11 out of 10 qualified and a bloke will mm. have a shot, you know, the Hail Mary, as you called it, whether he might have two or three of the 10 criteria. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because it was, a few years ago, it was, it was kind of like, we think this might be a myth, but then it wasn't a myth, but it could have been a myth that actually then people bought into. Mm. But the reality is that, that women tend to be more reluctant to put their hand up for that next stretch role. So there's two things that are really important in that. Number one for women, getting a great strategic mentor and career sponsor to help give you that gentle nudge, that push, that encouragement to step in and step up to the next stretch role and let her know, yep, this is gonna feel really bloody uncomfortable. (laughs) When you are learning, when you are stretching, it's it can feel a bit 
you know, discombobulating. And then on the other side, it's actually from a, a system side, there's a, there's a bunch of that you can do. So let me take your, your own example. It is likely, without having looked at anything, any of the language that you use in your job ads, your job descriptions, your hiring process, it is highly likely that that is gendered because it is based on both of your lived experience. And there are, there's a whole, it's funny, you know, because I actually wrote a piece this morning for a woman I collaborate with about how to close the gender pay gap. And one of it's around hiring practices. So there's some key things around hiring practices that can close the gender leadership gap, as well as the gender pay gap. The first one is when you're writing job ads, are they, greatest respect guys, but is it around bro culture? You know, ninja. Ninja is, do you know what, Ninja is, uh, oh, I wish I had the article in front of me. There's been some exponential growth in the use of that word in the last five years. Of course. Now, yeah. in the, with the explosion of tech and what have you. So, Ninja skills are really sought after. That, that's quite gendered because we don't see many female Ninja movies, right? Anyway, so there's, there'll be gendered language that is subliminally off-putting to women, even at the job ad stage or from the recruitment stage, let alone the position description and then the, the interview or the hiring process. Cool. Well, I have a question. Okay. You said something about how you know, all the gendered expectations and stuff actually start before high school. Yep. So, so you know, primary school, elementary school. What does it actually look like? Is this a, a curriculum that we introduce? Is it a culture that you bring into schools? Is it rules that you add? What does it mean to, to really try and fix it back in that stage of life? I am so glad you asked me that question. <laughs> so I am going to give an unashamed plug for a movement that I'm an ambassador for called Girls Uniform Agenda. And here's one real way that primary schools can start levelling the playing field. And I use that term really deliberately. So when I went to school and when girls are still going to school, girls wear skirts and dresses Mm. and boys wear shorts and pants. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to do a cartwheel, ride a bike, run around an oval, climb a tree or anything with a dress or a skirt on, often one that's got to be a regular tree two inches below the knees. No can do. Mm -hmm. So remember I said girls stop being physically active at a certain point in their life? If, if we change just one thing, if we had uniform equity in, in primary schools across Australia, the world, and girls could choose either pants or shorts. And quite frankly, if boys want to wear skirts and dresses, they should be able to too. Mm. But if they could, if girls could have the choice of wearing garments that don't restrict them, hobble mm. them and hold them back, gee whiz, uh, the messaging around that is so profoundly disruptive to, wow. to the way we've been doing stuff. You know, that is that could be done tomorrow. Mm. That's really I was not expecting that answer. Actually, it makes <laughs> sense. I remember, I'm not going to go into the reasons why, but I, I remember the first time I put a dress on, I was like, my gait is so restricted. <laughs> I don't have any pockets. Like, no they, pockets. That's the big one. Yeah. <laughs> this is awful. You know, I know when I sit down, I have to make sure that I'm not, you know, <laughs> where, whereas I put on a pair of jeans and you know, life's yep. good. Yeah. And so let's talk about heels. Mm. Mm. Heels, high, high heeled shoes originally, or block heeled shoes, were originally made for men riding astride on horses so that they could, you know, get Clip into, into the stirrup. The, yeah. yep. But they didn't wear them once they got off the horse because they're too damn uncomfortable and they can't mm. run in them. But then, yet, we, we ask women to wear heels. And I look at, I've, I've got to be transparent. I've wore until four years ago when I was told I needed a knee replacement unless I lost my love of high heels. I have worn heels my entire life because I love them. But when I realised that it was actually harming me and it was going to result in a pretty major operation, guess what I did? Okay, I lost the heels. Hmm, what's happened in my life? I walk miles. I, can, I don't have to change shoes to go to work, or not that I have to change shoes to go to work. I work for myself. So, But, you know, it, it, yeah. it's just these, these, these subtle things. But back to your question, if we had uniform equity... I reckon that opens up a whole bunch of other things because then you're going to start seeing girls saying, all right, now that I can run and jump and mm. 
do whatever. I'd like to play baseball. I'd like to play soccer. I'd like to play mm. footy. And I can play footy kick to kick in the, you know, in the, on the oval at, at recess or at lunchtime. Yeah. There's it. this movement, Don't, right? So this this uniform gender movement. Yep. Does it does it pressure like these a, a particular school's administration, or is it like a larger scale uh, government kind of approach? So it's a it's a started off as a grassroots movement. There are ambassadors, or well, there are <clears throat> it's, it's Australia wide, and they're a lobby lobby and policy group. They are self funded by a group of amazing women who mm. uh, who just said. I want my kid to be able to wear whatever she wants to wear, (laughs) particularly sporty kids. So they started and little and like a whole bunch of other things have got really big. So girls uniform agenda and it is, it it has been eye opening for me being a part of that or uh, being an ambassador uh, for that movement. Is it quite a recent movement? Yeah. I, In the uh, last couple of years, yeah. And I'm being a really poor ambassador by not being able to name exactly <laughs> when it started. But it's interesting, yeah. I'm so like, if you if you Google girls uniform agenda, there's you know, they've got all the you know, the instas and the Facebooks and the and there's a web web page. But they've done some significant lobbying at um, state government level mm. and you know, it, it's it's just such an important it, it seems such a little thing, but it's, it's a significant, mm. significant structural change. And for me, I, I like to think at a system level. And if that's if that part of the system could be dismantled, it just opens up possibilities. Because then what's mm, next? I agree. And then it's what's such a simple next? change too. Yeah, mm-hmm. this shouldn't even be a problem. <laughs> no, <laughs> it should be should be an easy change. Uh, cool. I've got a fun question to ask you. Okay. I always like I always like to end on a fun question. Uh, so unless there's any, no, any burning good. questions, I think I'll just I'll just jump to that. So, so my question for you, totally irrelevant to everything <laughs> we've talked about, what is your wrestling intro song? Yeah. So Michelle walks into a room. <laughs> I've got it. The room goes quiet. Oh, I've already got the what answer. What is the What is the song that starts blaring? It's the same as my signature karaoke song, actually. Okay. Fantastic. Nancy Sinatra, these boots are made for walking. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. Very cool. Other than that, my second choice, because, you know, overachiever, is <laughs> Helen Reddy, Hear Me Roar. <laughs> I am woman, hear me roar. Enough big to explore. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> which is actually my ringtone on my phone as well, which makes people go, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. That's a great choice. I think both are um, both are actually relevant to the conversation we've had today. That's so right. That's good. <laughs> well, I'm nothing if not consistent. <laughs> <laughs> so good to talk to you. Cool. Yeah, it's it's really good conversation, mm. and Thanks I'm for the really I'm really happy we had this conversation after I had a daughter because it definitely <laughs> suddenly relevant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not to sound like a, a, a cliche, but it definitely brings it more into into view into frame. I'd well, all I, all I can say in that regard is, you know, if I think about my own childhood, I just had no idea that girls couldn't do what boys could do because despite all of the external messaging, when I was at home and in my home with my parents, mm. I was never limited in, in what even what I was thinking about and talking about um, and yep. encouraged to explore and take risks. So that's that can be your role. It all starts um, at home. Good, yeah. good start. Well, that's, she is... She is She'll have no problems there. Good, <laughs> good. And she can always she, she can always watch this podcast. Yeah, in, in ten years, when she and make sure up. she supports the West Coast Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michelle. Thanks for your time. Well, yeah. My Thank pleasure, you so guys. Much, Michelle. Talk. See ya. All right. Bye. See ya. Welcome to the end of another episode of Tech Society. On this day, August twenty first, nineteen ninety three, NASA lost contact with the Mars Observer spacecraft three days before it was to enter orbit around Mars. The reason for the loss of contact was never actually determined, but the most probable cause was a rupture of a fuel tank. So, seriously sad. So to the Mars Observer spacecraft, we salute you. We salute you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for listening, everyone. I'm Alex. I'm John. See you later. Bye.